After a few weeks break from Revelation, we are jumping back in. And the next big section goes all the way from chapter 6 up to chapter 16 in Revelation. The sermon I preached from this section I called The Seals and the Sealed. If you are new to this channel, I do encourage you to subscribe, like this video, share it with those who you think it would be helpful to share it with. And I've made videos already of chapters 1 to 5, so you can go back and look at those. What we've seen so far is this glorious picture of Jesus in chapter 1 saying to his church, Do not fear. And then in chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, Jesus is both warning and encouraging his people to be counted among uh, the victorious ones who make it to the glorious end victorious. And then in chapters 4 and 5, we are taken into the throne room of heaven where we see the Lord God Almighty seated on his throne, reigning in control and being worshipped. And chapter 5, we see the Lamb who is slain. He is the one who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll because he was killed. His blood was shed and he has ransomed people for himself. Now in this chapter, we or this section at least, we're going to see the lamb opening these seals. Now this scroll with the seven seals, which we saw in chapter five, is a scroll containing the unfolding news of judgment against this world which stands in rebellion against God. And here we're going to see the Lamb as the one who executes that judgment. So first, just to see, we, we see the seven seals in this section. You see that repetition. And then we've got this interlude in the middle, which takes us then to the seventh seal. But not only do we have the seals, we also have those who are sealed, those who have the seal of the living God on them. It's repeated here as well. The NIV doesn't translate it or doesn't add it into their translation. So we see both the seals opening the scroll of God's judgment, but we see those who are sealed. And the important thing that we see is that those who are sealed won't face the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb is a terrifying thing that we see in this section. But if you want to be saved from the wrath of the Lamb, you need to be sealed by the blood of the Lamb. Because these sealed ones are those who are wearing white robes. And these white robes, we are told, have been washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. So if you want to be saved from the wrath of the Lamb, saved from the ultimate judgment to come, then you need to be counted among those who have been sealed by the blood of the Lamb. Now, an important thing to say up front in this section, the first four of the seals are describing the world as we know it now. This is the unfolding events of these last days between Jesus Christ uh, ascension into heaven and when he returns again we see that our world is a world characterized by suffering and even those who have been sealed are not protected from this suffering we will face the suffering that comes from living as sinners in a sinful and broken world but those who are sealed are protected from the final judgment that we see in the last two seals they are sealed by the blood of jesus for eternity. In an ultimate sense, those who have been saved by Jesus are safe and secure. Now, this lamb who we met in chapter 5, we see playing this important role. He is the one who is opening these seals. So he is executing God's judgment here. And we see at the end of Chapter 6, the wrath of the Lamb, which is an absolutely terrifying thing. But then we saw, see those, this great multitude who are gathered before the Lamb. Uh, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. It's a glorious picture that we are uh, given in this section. The Lamb will be their shepherd. 
But again, we see this lamb who is protecting his sealed ones for eternity. He's also the one executing judgment, which we see ultimately as he opens the seventh seal. In chapter 4, we were given this picture of um, him who sits on the throne. Uh, that is the Lord God Almighty. And we see uh, the living God in this image, particularly in chapter 7 here. He is the one who is seated on the throne. Uh, the throne is central in that um, picture in chapters 4 and 5, showing that there is somebody seated and reigning and ruling on the throne in heaven. So as we see, the image uh, that we're given in chapters uh, 1 through to 5 is growing here. Um, chapters 1 to 5 lay this wonderful foundation for us. For those who have been redeemed, we can listen to Jesus' words in chapter 1, do not be afraid. But here we see those who haven't been redeemed are facing the full extent of God's wrath, partic particularly in seals 6 and 7. The creatures who we saw um, in chapter 4, who are in the 4 and 5, who are in the throne room of heaven, um, they are the ones here yeah, calling out these uh, horsemen. So in that picture in chapters 4 and 5, these living creatures are there surrounding the, the throne of God and orchestrating the praise to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So they are like the, the choir masters calling all creation to worship him. But here they are calling these horsemen who we see. We see four times here they say, come, come, come. When it comes to structure, uh, these first eight verses go together as the first four seals are opened and we see these um, four horses with their riders. And John wants us to know that he was watching this play out. We see this repetition, um, I watched or I looked. We see this type of language used throughout this big section. I saw. Not only does John see, he also hears. We see I looked, but I also heard. But now coming back to these four horsemen, they're sometimes called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, as I read the text, I understand them to be a picture of the world we're living in right now. We're not necessarily waiting for these four horsemen to arrive. They are symbolic of the pain and the suffering that comes in this world as a result of tyrannical rulers. Because this rider on the horse has a bow and a crown, so he's a, a picture of a military leader. So a king or an emperor who leads by force, and people would have jumped to mind in John's day. But as we think, we've seen our history littered with military-minded rulers. Now, the next three horses aren't necessarily different kinds of rulers, but they show the results of this military leadership. Where the fiery red horse comes and you see uh, he shows a world full of strife and war with his large sword. And then we see this uh, black horse holding a pair of scales and we hear this uh, pound of wheat, two pounds of wheat for a, a day's wages, six pounds of barley for a day's wages. Uh, this is giving us a picture of famine and starvation. The two pounds of wheat for a day's wages is, is kind of a handful of wheat. For a whole day's work, it's not enough to feed this man, let alone his whole family. So as a result of this uh, military leader, we see strife and war, which results in famine and starvation. And what comes hot on the heels of war and strife and famine and starvation? Well, the pale horse. The, the color here is uh, the color of a corpse. So this is death on a horse. And death 
follows swiftly behind strife and war and famine and starvation. And now in one sense, yes, there may be military leaders like this coming who are going to bring strife and warfare and famine and starvation, but this is the world we live in. Just go and follow the news. Look for countries facing war and famine and starvation and strife, and the list just goes on and on. And this has been since Jesus ascended into heaven, and it will be until he returns. So that's why I understand this to be these last days that we're living in right now. We're given the summary statement at the end of verse um, 8. They were given power. The they there is these four horsemen, this symbolic picture of the chaos that military leaders bring into our world. They were given power over a fourth of the earth, so not complete power, but to kill by sword, famine, and plague by the wild beasts of the earth. So we see many people will die an unnaturally early death. Now, as I said in earlier videos, we need to remember that in order to understand Revelation well, we actually need a good understanding of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, somebody has said that all the Old Testament prophets rendezvous in Revelation, and we see that uh, happening in this section. And these horsemen, you can go and uh, look at Zechariah 6, verse 1 to 8. We see a similar image there in the, the poetic language of the prophets. Uh, this image of killed by the sword and famine and plague. You can go and look at Ezekiel 14, uh, verse 12 to 21. We see a similar image there. So this isn't something completely new that John is being shown here. We're just seeing what the prophets foretold is coming to bear in history as we know it. Now the next section is a smaller section from verse 9 to 11, just as we see the fifth seal being opened and we see the souls of those who had been slain and we hear the cry of the martyrs. And they are the first time that we, we see this group, the souls of those who had been uh, slain and they are calling out in a loud voice, How long, O Lord? Uh, we see that they are wearing white robes which is a symbolic of victory and purity. They're told to wait a little longer. So they, this is just showing us that in this world of suffering, uh, Christians, those who have been saved by Jesus, are not exempt from that suffering. Um, even Christians will die as a result of suffering. And these are those who have died specifically because of the word of God and their testimony. So they've died as martyrs because of Jesus. Um, but we see... They are victorious. They've been purified because of Jesus. Uh, we'll see them a bit later. Again, this great multitude around the throne. And we see that their prayers, this how long, sovereign Lord, their prayers are heard. Uh, we see here the prayers of God's people went up. We see again the prayers of all the people in the golden altar. Um, it, God hears the prayers and he is going to answer them and he is going to judge all humanity one day with a great final judgment. But at this stage in chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, we hear the cry of the martyrs saying, How long, O Lord? And again, we hear these types of words um, in the prophets. We hear them in uh, Psalm 13. We'll hear them in um, Habakkuk chapter 1. How long, O Lord? This has been a cry throughout the centuries and God is answering in this picture. He's saying this will come to an end. It won't last forever. Then as the sixth seal is opened and we're going to see this type of pattern as we continue in the big section um, in Revelation, we'll see these um, seven repetitions of seven. And the first five are talking about the world we live in today and the last two catapults us to the final judgment when Jesus returns one day. And what we see here is a picture of that day. This is Jesus returning, and it is a terrifying picture. Uh, we see the kings and all these people. It's not only kings, it's even the slave and the free. Everyone, they try to hide in rocks and in mountains. And this is a terrifying thought. They call on the mountains. For us here in Cape Town, Imagine calling Table Mountain 
to fall on you. You'd rather have Table Mountain fall on you than to face him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. If you aren't one who has been sealed by the blood of the Lamb, you will face the wrath of the Lamb. And that is an absolutely terrifying thing. When that day of wrath comes, who can stand it? And again, we see uh, the prophets coming here in Joel chapter 2, verse 11. We're given a picture like this. Um, here we see Isaiah 34, um, Jeremiah 4, Joel 2. The prophets are rendezvousing. These promises of God's final judgment are coming uh, to bear. This is the day when Jesus returns. This is the end of history as we know it. And it's very clear. I mean, the heavens are receding like a scroll. The mountains and the islands are being removed from their place. It's a chaotic, terrifying picture painted for us here. And then that's the sixth seal. And before John gets to the seventh seal, says, after this, I saw. And we're given the most incredible picture in the midst of the suffering. It says he sees these angels holding back the winds from the four corners of the earth. Uh, that, that's another picture of the winds of judgment that are coming. But they're told, don't harm the land or the sea. Hold those winds back. Hold these riders back until we have sealed the servants of our God. And then this is a much debated section where we see the 144,000. Does that mean there's only going to be 144,000 in uh, glory one day? And straight away, verse 9, what he heard and what he saw don't match up. Because he heard 144,000, but he saw a great multitude that no one could count. So this 144,000 is uh, a symbolic number, and we can understand it by numbers that we've seen in Revelation already, and we'll see later on. Uh, Twelve, the Old Testament uh, tribes, and twelve apostles. The so twelve times twelve is 144, and a thousand in Revelation is symbolic of a, a very large number. So. 144,000, the Old Testament people of God, the New Testament people of God, and a big number of them, the complete number of them. But straight away we're told it's a great multitude that no one can count. So, and they are from not just the tribes of Israel. This is the true Israel from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They're standing before the throne. And why can they stand there? Because they're wearing white robes. These are robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. These are the redeemed ones. These are the victorious ones of chapters 2 and 3. They've made it to the glorious end, victorious, and they're singing praise because of the salvation. The Lamb who is slain in chapter 5 has saved them. And again, we see all of the Old Testament prophets rendezvousing in this section. Um, we see in Isaiah 1, there's a an image of these dressed in white. Um, Daniel 12. Uh, this is a, a quote from um, Isaiah 49. The long-awaited restoration of Israel has come. And this incredible picture of the, the Lord shepherding his people is a rich Old Testament uh, passage. Um, Ezekiel 34 is just one place where you can go and read up about that. Um, and it's a present reality for Christians. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. The Lord is shepherding his people. And the Lord wiping tears from their eyes um, is a picture from Isaiah 25. And leading to living water, uh, we've got Psalm 23 in view. So we see so much of the Old Testament coming together. These promises that God's people had been longing for are all finding their fulfillment in Jesus, the Lamb. This Lamb who is executing God's judgment is also the Lamb who has redeemed a people, saved them by his blood.
He's going to feed them and give them water to drink. He'll be their shepherd, leading them to living water and wipe their tears from their eyes. And again, if you then go and read John's gospel, we see Jesus saying that he is the living water. He is the bread that they'll never hunger. He is the good shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus is this Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in the midst of the suffering, this was an incredible picture given to God's people to encourage them to keep going, to keep going, to make it to the glorious end victorious. But then to close the loop on these seven seals, we see the Lamb, this Lamb whose blood was shed to redeem a people for himself. That Lamb executes God's final judgment because what we see here, this silence in heaven, is an Old Testament picture of divine judgment. If you go and look at uh, Zephaniah 1 verse 7 to 10, or Zechariah 2 verse 13, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. After chapters 4 and 5, where we, we just see this continual repetition of praise to him who is on the throne and to the lamb who is slain, all of a sudden now, as the seventh seal is opened, everything goes silent. No one can say a word before the just and terrible judgment of God. The wrath of the lamb now comes. And we see everything coming apart as the angel takes the censer, fills it with fire from the altar, hurls it on the earth. And we saw in chapter 4 these peals of thunder and rumblings and flashings of lightning coming from the throne of God. And here that judgment is coming with full force and no one can say a thing. God is just in his judgment and the one executing this judgment is the Lamb. The Lamb who opens the seals on the scroll of God's judgment. And the only way to be safe from the wrath of the Lamb is to be counted among those who have been sealed by the Lamb, who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's the big thing that this section should teach us. In this world that is characterized by suffering, even as God's sealed people, we are not immune from the suffering. We will face strife and uh, difficulties, suffering, and ultimately death. But in an ultimate sense, we have been sealed for eternity with God, where the Lamb will be our shepherd. He'll lead us to springs of living water and every tear will be wiped from our eyes. We're going to see this picture come to its fulfillment in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. But before that, we need to remember that judgment is coming. And this should both stir us to wonder that we have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, but it should also grow in us a great urgency because we shouldn't want anyone to be among this group who are calling on the mountains to fall on them and hide them from him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We don't want people to face the wrath of the Lamb. Rather, we want them to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. And so as you dig into this further, it should thrill your heart at the wonder of the gospel, but also cause you to really have an urgency to warn people. And we need to take this picture seriously. The suffering we see in the world at the moment warns us and reminds us that there is a sure and certain and final judgment where no one will be able to say a thing. And the only ones who will stand on that day are those who have been sealed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, as you dig in further, I pray that God would grow your wonder at the gospel as you see all of God's promises and warnings and judgment coming to a fulfillment in this book. Rejoice in Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Rejoice that you are counted among those who have been sealed and live for him as you wait for that final day when he will bring the curtains down on history as we know it. Well, God bless as you dig in further.